Tony, welcome to the show, man. It's great to visit with you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure, buddy. So uh, you are joining us from the great state of Florida. Other than Texas, it's probably like, uh, well, I mean, it has a lot to do with DeSantis. Let's not kid ourselves. I love I love what he's doing. And uh, yeah, I, I spent my 40th birthday there for that reason. It's like, who wants to go spend money in California? No, here's Florida. You know, these are, <laughs> these are, these are like-minded folks over there. But uh, we went snook fishing and had an absolute blast. Yeah, we have an amazing fishery in Florida, just in general, and definitely thankful to be in this state over the last couple of years for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about yourself. Are you a uh, Floridian by uh, birth? No. So actually, I'm a transplant. Um, I'm from Minnesota, grew up okay. just outside the Twin Cities. So for me, fishing and hunting was more my passion growing up and then got into diving uh, when I was a kid with my dad and that translated trips in the keys eventually moving down here after college so i'm oh, wow. I'm, one, I'm a transplant yep okay cool so uh, minnesota is a place that i've spent some time uh like boundary waters trips uh yep. for smallies and the occasional pike and uh my dad hooked into he got bored we, we were catching so many smallies and i think we've done that trip on both sides of the border canada and minnesota gosh probably five or six times now and my dad's like he's a better fisherman than i am um not much of a hunter, but his arm was getting tired of catching smallmouth. He's like, forget this. I'm going to, he put on a big football head jig and we paddled out to the middle of the lake. And I think it was like 40 feet of water. And he hooked into what I was like, you hooked a stump. And then the stump started dragging the canoe everywhere. And it was like a, you know, a 30 pound lake trout, which was pretty cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. I've been up to the boundary waters once before and yeah. it was just, you don't really have to do much to catch fish. It's pretty phenomenal. Right. So yep. Growing up, what kind of fishing did you do? Uh, well, my grandparents had a cabin up in Walker, Minnesota. So every year, you know, when it was ice, uh, lake was iced over, the eel pout peel out was a huge part. We did that every winter. Um, but a lot of walleye up there was the main uh -huh. thing. Walleye and then the small lakes around uh, my hometown of Hutchinson. We, you know, do like the sunfish and just all the smaller stuff, bass and everything. Uh -huh. um, and Walleye's then in call. As far as walleye is there. tough to beat yeah and we get northern pike up there never caught a muskie that was one i don't know how much money i spent on lures growing up or my dad spent rather <laughs> yeah but never 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 ended up catching a muskie yet um, i think i would go up there with like a hundred dollars worth of stuff it's like this will catch a pike and yeah uh, I'd catch like two and then lose the rest of the lures so yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's fun yeah. um but Duluth, I don't know if you've ever been up to Duluth, Minnesota. That's a mm -hmm. really phenomenal fishery. So we did a lot of fishing up there, a lot of fly fishing through college and, um, you know, when I wasn't diving and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. So you've been in the Keys for how long? About eight years now, full time. And yep. licensed captain for seven years, you told me off the air? Yes. Yep. So what is a typical trip like uh, for, for your charter business? It really depends. Uh, so we do all private trips. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just the individual, the group family on the boat. Um, and we specialize in spear fishing and uh, inshore offshore fishing. So it really depends on what the group wants to do. But a couple of our main things, we do a lot of line fish hunting um, on scuba and they're an invasive fish. So that is a ton like of fun you to call hunt. It, you call it hunting there. So, oh yeah, we're hunting them yeah. for sure. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, we do a lot of free diving for Wahoo, like pelagic species, um, which is a ton of fun. Um, summertime offshore fishing for Mahi and blackfin tuna is phenomenal. And spend a lot of time in the winter, just, you know, on the patch reefs and reef ledges for yellowtail snapper, mangrove snapper is a ton of fun as well. Okay. Right on, right on. We are, we have a really, um, a really healthy red snapper fishery off the coast of Texas. I like, do. Yes. It's amazing. And, um, I've been doing that. One of my college buddies, his dad had an offshore boat and the, the, the regulations have always been so damn frustrating, you know, and, and, and sometimes we have like a two month season and, and then it's been like a three day season and it's all based off of the, you know, how fast the, the quota is hit. A lot of that is commercial fishing and the, um, you know, recreational anglers tend to get screwed on that deal. But the, the fishery seems to be healthier every year. We catch more snapper and bigger snapper and we catch them quicker than we did the year before. Uh, so it tells me that the, the, the snapper fishery is, is vibrant and healthy. Do you guys have a pretty healthy red snapper fishery as well? So it's interesting about red snappers. They nearly got fished to extinction. 
you know. So and you guys so are the ma- problem because it's been managed. No. As, it manages like a <laughs> Gulf Coast uh, population, which we know that these right. fish don't migrate. So for for them to say, okay, Texas, uh, you guys have the same restrictions as Florida and Alabama, it doesn't make any sense to me because these fish maybe move from one reef to the other, but uh, they're not nomadic. They're sticking pretty much to the same general geographic area that they always have. Yeah, larvae move around, you know, the fry move around and stuff. Yeah. But uh, for instance, just with red snapper, you know, years ago, I never saw them off Isla Mirada, which is where we're at. And this oh, last right. season, I, I saw them on some of our spots in Isla Mirada, some of the deeper oh, wow. wrecks. So for me, that like to see that, act, I mean, that's how it used to be a long time ago. And there's, you know, the tor- dry tortugas has a healthy red snapper fishery now, which wasn't there before. But I mean, I think in general, red snapper is just one of those fish that's just controversial <laughs> with the right. commercial commercial right. side, the recreational side, management side, but it is a huge success story on how management can bring a species back. No, absolutely. I, I mean, yeah. it's you guys have probably a healthier tarpon fishery than we, we do, but like 70 years ago, Port Aransas, Texas was like the self-proclaimed tarpon capital of the world. Not so, not so much anymore, you know? Yeah. It's, uh, and and pro- maybe some of it is because uh, you walk into some of the, the longtime watering holes there and the walls are just tarpon scales okay we killed all the tarpon so like, right you know well um, i think one thing that really helps us out here too in the keys is we got the gulf stream running past us offshore so mm-hmm. it's bringing different migratory fish through so it it gives people an opportunity to switch things up you know like got tarp in the summer mahi in the summer and then you know people transition to sailfish you know more in the winter months and and we transition to wahoo for spearing in the winter months then grouper you know in the summer so I think it, it's nice because it, a lot of the charter fleet recreational fisheries will spend most of their summer offshore fishing, which relieves stress on the reef. Um, so I don't know. I think that helps out a lot too, what we got going on down here. Yeah. Um, well, so how I found you was this picture on, it came up in my Instagram feed and it was uh, a picture of, of, there you are. Uh, and then three other guys you know we're fishing a, a lion fish a, a lion fishing tournament okay I yes i think that these i don't know how many we get in texas i think they're starting to show up not a lot though um right you guys it's like feral hogs you guys are overrun with these damn things and we're, they, they're, yeah they're we're working hard to get them <laughs> do what i said we're working hard to get that many fish <laughs> yeah 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 for sure um but I mean, these are native to the, the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, they don't belong off the coast of Florida or, or in the Gulf of Mexico. Somebody irresponsibly probably just released an aquarium pet or uh, right. p- probably a bunch of people have done that. And so here we, here we are in 2022 with a serious problem. And my understanding is that they don't really have any like predators that, that are preying on them. I don't know if it's because of their... Uh, spiny structure um, or, or what the deal is. I'm sure you probably are more well-versed with that, but talk a little bit about these fish and why they've become so prevalent. Yeah. Well, lionfish are, yeah, like you said, they're invasive, um, not native and invasive. So they're not from this region and uh, they are having a negative impact on our fishery and um, likely introduced from the aquarium trade, like you said, but mainly, you know, if you introduce something that's not what predators aren't used to seeing like groupers, sharks, stuff like that one, it's, it might not be the most appealing thing. And then they're armed with venomous spines all over them. So, yeah. um, it's a little, might be a little bit more work for a grouper to eat that versus another fish they're already used to. Um, with that being said, I, we have noticed like certain species, like kind of going after them. Like when we play oh. the fish, for instance, one, that, one thing that's really interesting is the manatees eat the carcasses in the marina. Really? So, yeah. So we have seen some nurse sharks go after them at times on the reef. Um, but for the most part, we're, we are the main predators, just humans hunting them, diving. And there's just not enough pressure from, there's just not enough divers doing this. Well, I'm, our, we've seen the numbers gone way down. Like I've been running charters for them for, for years. And we used to get, I would say on like an average day, we could hunt, we could kill at least 30 to 50 a day uh lionfish just with a regular group you know not a ton of experience just going out and diving and now we're averaging maybe like 10 or 15 a day huh. on just like an average day so you and you see when we do the derbies like this one you saw that photo like the numbers drop way down for a while um yeah. but with that being said if, if nothing's being done the numbers jump right back up uh-huh. 
uh-huh. so they do come back pretty quick. And so how often do you guys participate in these derbies? We do, well, there's two derbies a year that we got down in the Keys. We do those um, each mm-hmm. year. And then we're going to do another one in Miami that Invincible is uh, a boat manufacturer's hosting. Okay. Um, but we actually got a derby coming up this Saturday. So oh. pretty excited. I think I'm going to retract my statement. I think I remember that we did have a tournament in Texas at one time uh, for four line fish. I, I would so, think so. I mean, they're, yeah. yeah, they're there for sure. I, I don't know the Texas fishery as well. I just know that the structure is different. So the yeah. fish might be more isolated on, you know, different, you know, it's different here. We hunt a lot on the reef here. We have the barrier reef track, whereas in Texas, you're probably more hunting on structure, like different types of wreckage and stuff like that. Lots of, lots of oil rigs. Uh, yeah. Which are also our yeah. best snapper spots by and large. Yep. Um, okay. So these fish don't move very fast. Uh, my buddy in college, he had a, I had a freshwater aquarium and he had a saltwater tank and he had a line fish. And so I was always aware of, Hey, don't touch that one that will poke yeah. you and it will hurt. Um, which has something to do with why nothing wants to, to mess with them. It's probably like, you know, the aquatic version of messing with a porcupine. Some will do it. Not a lot of predators doing that. Um, what do these fish prey on? And they, cause they don't move fast. So how do they, how do they, why are they so adept at, at disrupting the natural, uh, um, ecosystem yeah so they go after pretty much anything they can fit in their mouth mm-hmm. which is a lot so um crustaceans shrimp and a lot of our uh viable fish like grouper snapper they're taking the small juvenile ones like the mm-hmm. smaller fry so like anywhere from you know film a few millimeters up to a few inches depending on the size um we actually shot a lionfish uh two days ago a larger one and it had a small flounder in its mouth wow like literally the first time i've seen that so literally must have just eaten it uh because it was it was like not decomposed at all um and the way that they do it is when we hunt them we'll look for like say a big coral head out in the sand and if you see a lot of uh like like we call minnows you know like silver side minnows or bait above it just covering the coral head there's always lionfish stacked around it but if you see a coral head that doesn't have that fish life on it you generally won't see lionfish Mm. um they can actually blow a little bit of water out their mouth and it creates like a false current and it makes fish swim against it. So you can, if you can imagine a fish swimming against the lionfish's mouth, that's blowing water and then they reverse it quick inhale and they can suck that fish right in. Wow. So that's, that's one unique way that they, that they hunt. It's really fun to watch them hunt. It just yeah. takes a while sometimes <laughs> to yeah, watch them. No, I definitely remember my buddy would, buy some other expensive fish put it in there and then the lion fish would eat it <laughs> like <laughs> yeah i had them at, yeah in college i had a ton of reef tanks and yeah my my lion fish was very well fed to keep them away from the other fish in the tank for sure oh, there went 30 dollars on that little tang that just got smoked by him you know so yep uh yep yeah i mean we have uh we have other and and just like you guys have peacock bass in florida yeah, we have yeah. the main thing I'm seeing now, uh, which they're kind of doing some roundups for is Placostomus, which are native to like the Amazon rainforest. Right. And um, I was actually, so I've always had freshwater tanks. So I've always had a Placostomus to keep it clean. And I went on a mission trip in Brazil as a young man. I think it was like 18 or 19 and was fishing uh, with this guy out of his, his dugout canoe. And he's, well, we were gigging and um, he gigs the Placostomus. And I was like, holy crap. I got, I have one of those in my tank back home. And it was like, Oh, that's where these fish that's are native not... to right here. Uh, yeah. But we do have, we do have people, um, even like, uh, uh, university projects where students are working on, um, removing some of those invasive Pocostomus. So it's not, it's not specific to just, uh, salt water by, by any stretch of the yeah. imagination. Um, I don't know if the peacock bass have such a, are having a negative effect on the freshwater fishery like the uh the lionfish are though not that i know of yeah i think they're pretty saw everybody's catch and release you know for the most mm-hmm. part yeah it's a fun fishery for folks that go after them so that so but, that's when it's generating money for the economy yeah well i mean and lionfish is coming around you know like the last couple of years it's it's now more of a delicacy and you know you see it in restaurants it's a very high priced fish uh because it's hard to get we have to shoot them you know, um, but for a while there, if a, cl- a customer or ours or a guest would take a lionfish to a restaurant, they wouldn't cook it. 
you know, they didn't, they didn't want to get stung. They thought the meat was uh, poisonous, which it's not, it's just the venomous spines. Right. So over the last couple of years, big part of these derbies, like the one we participate in is just educating the community and the public on, you know, some of these fallacies and, but they are delicious fish. So you see uh Publix, you know, whole foods is, is taking these line fish in, um, huh. and a lot of the local restaurants. Um, so they'll so actually buy them from you. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to have a, you have to have a, a certain license to sell them and stuff very easy to get through the state. Um, but yeah, when we do the derbies, um, uh, we, yeah, we sell the fish and they go straight to a restaurant or somewhere and, you know, people consume them. So how do you keep the fish good? I'm assuming that the derby isn't done in the middle of the winter. And even if it was, you're in the keys. So how do you, how, how many fish did you guys catch in that picture that I'm referring to? It was that it was one. Like, we the whole boat is yeah. the bottom of the boat is full of line fish. And it's a big boat. It's a 36 foot boat. So that, that was a uh, 564 fish. And over what, that, over what time frame? Over two days. Wow. So for, for us in the keys, that's a, that's a crazy, that, that beat the record, the previous record, which we set two years prior. And uh, uh, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. Oh, yeah. um, I think that's going to be, it's going to be hard for us to break that one. <laughs> we're working hard. But, but the fish, uh, yeah, we just keep them on ice and then, uh, they go straight to the restaurant, the restaurant cleans them and then they get, and then they get frozen. Okay. So they'll get flash, they'll get flash frozen. And then as they use them, they'll take them out. Um, or on a larger scale, like whole foods will come down with it, with a certain truck and they take them, send them straight for prep. Uh -huh. Okay. And so what is the, uh, do you, do you sell other species of fish too? I do not know. Nope. Okay. So that's an, that's interesting that because of, you know, their invasive status, uh, you're able to, is because you're not a commercial fisherman, but you are able to just sell these to restaurants. Right. I, well, I have commercial, I have commercial license for a few different species, but, um, the bulk of what I do is, is charter fish, take people, you know, charter fishing and, and spear fishing. Uh, but with the lion fish for the, like the derby, for instance, like, I don't know what I'm going to do with over 500 lion fish. Right. So for, for me to try to flay those out or something, it would take me a long time. So, um, but yeah, I mean, that's a good way. And the restaurants don't have easy access to them necessarily. So when they are able to get a haul like this, it means a big deal to the restaurant. Uh, you know, that, that's, that, that supports sense. them for quite a while. Yeah. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, yeah. And I've heard, I have never eaten it, but I've heard that it is delicious, it, uh, white flaky. It, it is white flaky meat, very clean. And they have a wonderful diet. You know, they're eating all of our prized fish <laughs> that we like to eat. So they're just eating the smaller versions of it. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, the fame, I guess the famous preparation that I like is lionfish ceviche or else the whole fried lionfish. Those okay. two, the ceviche is just phenomenal. So what do you, when they do the whole fried lionfish, do they just snip the venomous ends of the? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yep. Yeah. There's a number of spines throughout, but the pectoral fins and the tail fin are not venomous. So you leave those on. And when they're breaded and fried up, they taste just like a, I call it sea bacon. Tastes like, mm. just like a potato chip. Very nice. good. Nice. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. We do crappie tails here. Fry them up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. A lot of people are like, I'm not eating that. I'm like, yeah, you're missing. Oh, it's good. Yeah. It's good. Nice yeah. and salty. Absolutely. And so what I've never been spearfishing. It's like one of those things that's on the bucket list. Um, snorkeling is probably the farthest I've gone as, to, you know, as far as like exploring a coral reef and I've done it in Hawaii um, when I was like 15 or 16. And then um, Mexico a couple of times vacation stuff, but it, what is the process there? How deep are you actually uh, going for? Like, I don't know if these fish live 20 feet below the surface or 120, no idea. Yep. Uh, well, that's one of the, that's one of the, like the tough things about lionfish is they are extremely diverse and where they can survive. So, mm -hmm. um, subs and cameras have seen these fish down, you know, well past a thousand feet and we wow. see them in the mangrove estuaries and two feet of water. So yeah, there's my pup just coming to say hi. Oh, yeah. Um, yep. He's an eight month old, just baby. Golden um, retriever. golden retriever. Yep. Nice. Yep. He's a good boy. Um, but so we, when we're hunting, it really depends. Like when we're doing the derby, we're, we're trying to look on like pieces that like areas that have really good relief structure, you know, like all fish, like those, those steep drop-offs or holes, you know, it's the same thing that we fish up North. Um, so that's mainly what we're focusing on, but for a charter standpoint, uh, we, sometimes if people want to try to hunt them, uh, you know, free diving or snorkeling, we look at coral heads that are very shallow. Um, so like 15 feet of water. Again, you might not get as big a fish as they are deeper, but we can still find them. 
So it really just depends on what the, you know, what your level at is, but scuba diving generally 60 to 90 feet is where we're finding them. And then snorkeling, try to do like around 35 feet is a good range. Okay. Okay. And yep. what is the average size? I mean, how big do these things get in an aquarium? Uh, I think our tanks were like 55 gallons. They're not going to get that big. Do they get pretty massive? They get pretty big. We, we have this state record too, uh, from a couple of years ago. And it was, uh, on my boat, we weighed at 4.2 pounds. Oh, wow. And by the time it actually landed in the office to get weighed in, it was sitting cooler on ice for a couple of days, dried out, you know, <laughs> but, 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 um, it ended up being 3.28 pounds. Wow. Okay. So, but yeah, the average size that we get is usually nine to 14 inches now. Um, a couple of years ago when there wasn't as much education and people going after them, they were, you know, we were getting about 16, 17 inches was kind of standard. We get a couple of those each day, but okay. for the most part, smaller. Okay. Okay. Fascinating stuff. Um, well, yeah, man, I just thought, I saw that picture. I was like, well, there's a, certainly an interesting conversation to be had here. And as, uh, as conservationists and, and, uh, sportsmen, you know, invasive species are, are something that's always mm, controversial for sure. And, yeah. um, what, what do we do with these things? How do we manage this? Like, so here we have these derbies, uh, in yep. Texas, you know, we, in Florida has feral hogs too, but, uh, in Texas, you know, we shoot them out of airplanes. I mean, uh, helicopters, we trap them. Uh, yeah. No, any hunt. If you see a hog, it's now a hog hunt. Like, it's like yeah, that's what I'm cool. starting to get into. I just, I just got myself an AR for hog hunting, and I'm like, I'm, I'm getting ready. Oh, nice. <laughs> when can, I, can when I'm on one use, trip, can you use thermal optics in uh, Florida? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, cool. Yep. So a few friends of mine, they have leases, and man, some of the hogs they get. My, my one buddy shot wow. over 500 pounds, which is beautiful. So. Oh wow. Yeah, that's a big pounds. hog. Yeah. That, yep. I mean, that was probably one that was domestic. That was really, like. People say, oh, I got a five, 600 pound hog. I, and I believe they did, but like a wild, uh, actual 100%, like just feral hog. If you get one over 300 pounds, that's, that's a pretty damn big pig. And uh, yeah, it's a large size for, te for Texas. Yeah. yeah. So awesome. Congrats I'm on the too. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> cool. Well, yeah, yep. man, I love Florida. Uh, found your page very interesting. If you want to give us your website and social media stuff where, where folks can uh, keep up with you and, and what you're doing there in the Keys. Absolutely. Yeah. The website is diveyoung.com. Uh, real short and sweet. And then Instagram is at Captain Tony Young, all spelled out. Okay. So, cool. yeah, love to spend some time with everyone on the water. Yeah. Well, next time I come to Florida, which hopefully be soon, because uh, like I said, I love your state. Um, I'll give you a shout. Okay. Awesome. It was great talking with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Tony. Take care, buddy. Yep. Yeah. You too. Bye-bye.